and welcome back to We The Union. I am your host, Daisha, and I want to thank you for joining me today. Today, our topic is going to be about grievances. So grievances, they are one of the ways in which union members can ensure that their employer is held accountable for breaching a union contract, violating workplace policies, or just violating union rights in general. Um, So what exactly is a grievance? A grievance is a complaint that is raised by an employee towards an employer within the workplace. Um, A grievance usually refers to the employer not complying with the terms of the collective bargaining agreement, or also known as the CBA, also known as a memorandum of understanding. There are a few different names out there, but in general, a union contract. So a violation of this agreement can involve failing to provide provide required pay or not maintaining safe working conditions. Um, it's it's a fairly broad, right? Fairly broad when you're dealing with like a CBA or an MLU. So both groups of workers and in- individuals may file a grievance, and grievances can involve a variety of issues, including violations of workplace policies. Um, violating union contracts, violating just safety issues. It can just be a variety of issues. So while many grievances are contract-related, there does not need to be a contractual violation in order to file a grievance. So before we get deeper into the grievance process, just know that it can be very broad and it can vary from employer to employer, which I'm sure I I will reiterate throughout this podcast. Um, So this, we're going to cover just basically some generals, some generalizations about the grievance process. So you can get, you know, just the basic gist of it. Um, But of course you always want to read your contract. So you know your grievance process um, and how your employer expects you to handle it and how your union will handle it. So there are four types of grievances, individual, group, union, and class action grievance. Um, An individual grievance is when management violates the contract and it only affects one employee. So examples include discipline, demotion, harassment, improper classification, or denial of earned income for one employee. Uh, Group grievance, in some cases, a management violation of the contract affects more than one person. So an example of that is if multiple employees were not allowed to take their afternoon 15-minute break, then they could file a group grievance. A union grievance is when the violation affects the union as an institution. So an example, if management failed to provide space for a union bulletin board required by the contract, a union grievance could be filed. Union grievances protect the right of the union to function as the certified employee representative. In some instances, management may violate the contract, but the employees may be unwilling or afraid to file a grievance. The steward has the option of filing a union grievance on behalf of the affected bargaining unit members. For a class action grievance, um, it usually is a grievance that is filed on behalf of a class of affected employees. So the class may be as broad as the entire bargaining unit, or it may be more narrow like a particular job classification, job title, or shift, or for example, like all water plant operators in the bargaining unit or all women in the bargaining unit. So an example of this is if an office assistant were not to be given back pay for a reclassification of the position, a class action grievance could be filed for all the employees with that job title. So every single union contract should include specific grievance procedures that outline the steps to be followed, right? Which is why... I suggest you read your contract so you know exactly, like you know all of your options, right? So grievance processes may differ, obviously, from employer to employer under, you know, your own contract. However, most will certainly have a general process in common. So what is this procedure? What is the process? Typically, the grievant, the employee, 
the union member, will reach out to the union representative or steward to go over some of the facts of the case to determine if a grievance can be filed. Sometimes an informal meeting with management can resolve the issue. However, if an informal meeting doesn't resolve the issue, then a formal grievance will be brought to the employee's supervisor or manager or HR representative, whoever typically handles the first step of a grievance um, at your workplace. So typically this is done you know, via a grievance form, an email, something in writing, right? You always want to make sure you do it in writing, in writing once the formal process has begun. So when submitting the grievance, certain information should be included, such as the time and date of the event that led to the grievance, if applicable, the name of the person the grievance is against, um, if it's a particular manager or supervisor, that would be the name you put. But if it's against the um, employer as a whole, then you typically would still put like you know, the manager's name or the executive director's name, um, whoever represents right the, the workplace. Um, the name of the person filing the grievance, you also want to include that. Um, a description of the basic facts of the grievance an indication of what parts of the contract were violated and a proposed solution to the grievance. So you can keep it really simple and, um, you know, just play. If it's you who wants to file the grievance, make sure your name's on it. Um, make sure whoever the manager's name, the HR person, the executive director, whoever it's against, make sure their name is included. Uh, just give some really basic details and facts. You don't want to like start putting evidence in there. You always want to keep like your evidence and your documentation for the actual hearing. So keep it simple, straight to the point. Let them know you violated Article 2, Section 3 of the contract. Um, make sure you can copy and paste that section of the contract so they can read it right then and there. Um, and you also want to make sure you include the remedy, like, you know, make sure that they know what you want from this situation. Don't just leave it open-ended. Make sure you're very specific and to the point. So for each grievance process, there's usually a timeline that must be followed. Um, so once again, read your contract. Make sure you note the timeline um, sometimes contracts will say, oh, you have to file a grievance within 30 days of the event. Um, if you don't follow that timeline, then your employer can just dismiss the grievance. Um, so you always want to make sure you stay within the timeline and you also want to make sure that management stays within the timeline. Um, some contracts will say that, you know, management must respond within 10 days of receiving the grievance. So if they don't respond, you can always move to the next step in your grievance process. Um, but yeah, make sure you hold them accountable and make sure you stay on time. So once the grievance has been filed, um, an investigation begins. Sometimes um, you can do you know some investigating before the, gr the grievance is filed, like if you just need to collect some facts before you decide to file the grievance. But usually once the grievance has been filed, then it, like an extensive investigation will begin. So how an investigation occurs can vary depending on the type of complaint. Um, for example, an investigation into a paycheck grievance may be resolved quickly by checking payroll and timesheets, right? Like, oh, I'm missing some money from my pay stub. Um, they can look into the timesheets looking to payroll, okay, you're right, sorry, we messed it up, resolved, right? <laughs> Super quick, to the point. Um, grievances that require more lengthy investigations may include many interviews, you know, viewing security footage, auditing emails, reviewing documentation. A thorough investigation should in include a clear conversation with the infected employee that includes questions beginning with the five W's. So the five W's are who, what, when, where, and why. 
You also want to interview any witnesses who might have been, who might have seen or heard anything related to the event. You also want to interview the supervisor involved in the event. Um, and then by meeting informally with the supervisor, you can sometimes learn helpful information and you may find a way of resolving the problem without having to even file a grievance. But that interview could also lead to you filing the grievance, right? Um, especially if they don't agree with what, you know, the union representative or the steward is saying. So before talking to a supervisor, always let the employee know that you're going to do that so they are comfortable with that. Once you've gathered your interviews, your documentation, like emails or uh, personnel files, it can be very extensive, right, depending on the situation. So once you have all of that, um, a grievance hearing will take place. So at the grievance hearing, all evidence and statements should be examined to allow the employer to decide on the grievance outcome. Um, copies of all the relevant documents, including statements, should be provided to the employee before the hearing. The employee may ask their witnesses to attend the hearing. The employer may also call witnesses to the hearing. So once all the evidence has been reviewed, all the interviews have been conducted, a decision will be made by the employer. So if the decision is made to uphold the grievance, the employer's next step is to take action to resolve the grievance. So whatever, well, typically whatever you put in your initial grievance filing, um, the employer could decide to just go with that. Um, sometimes the employer will try to, quote unquote, negotiate, um, you know, what the resolution will be. And so that is something that, you know, that conversation will have to happen, you know, with the employer, also with your union representative to make sure that it's the best decision for you as an employee. If the employer decides not to uphold the grievance, um, then the employee has the right to move forward with the next step in the grievance process to appeal the decision. Uh, for many union members, the grievance process has multiple steps. So if you have a step two, a step three of the grievance process, then it could go to upper level management. So for example, if your structure of your workplace is you have your direct manager that can handle it, um, then you may, the next step may be the grievance goes to an executive director, right? And they can review it. Um, so, and then maybe after the executive director, if you guys have an executive board, then the grievance can go to the executive board. So it varies from, you know, employer to employer, but sometimes there are those multiple steps. In many grievance procedures, the final step is arbitration. So once you've exhausted all of the other options as far as a grievance goes, then it can it can go to arbitration. So arbitration is negotiated in the contract. It is not automatic. So once again, you have to review your contracts to make sure that arbitration is an option. Um, so once it goes to arbitration, then a variety of things can happen. Um, you know, you're dealing with a third party at that point, and it's not just from employer to employee. There will be an outside organization that will, um, you know, read the grievance and then make a decision. Um, so this is kind of the basic, basic information about grievance processes. Um, there's so much more information out there. It can be, you know, there's a lot. So... Let's take a listen to a few, a couple of different examples of a grievance. Thanks, Wendy, for meeting with me today. I want to file a grievance. I believe, according to the contract, I should be making $20 an hour, but I notice I'm only making 19 And what position do you have with the company? I'm a loader. And how long have you been working for the company? I've been here for about a little over a year now, 14 months, uh, maybe more. Mm, 14 months. How come you didn't come to me sooner? Kevin explains to Wendy that he never really looked at his paycheck except for how much he takes home. But he noticed this time that he was making a dollar less than he should. 
shop steward Wendy has gone through the contract and then shows Kevin the heading in the CBA that says new hire and how it pertains to his situation and then explains its language. Okay, Kevin, I had a chance to go over the collective bargaining agreement, which we also know as the contract. So I looked specifically under the new hire um, because it's specific to your situation. So what I did read is that for the first 12 months, you should be making $19 an hour. And then after the 12 months, you should be making the $20 an hour. Oh, I didn't know that. Is there still a violation? Yes, there still is a violation. So what I need to do is I need to set up a meeting with management to go over the violation on the CBA. And then we can try and get your back pay for those few months. So there is a violation to the CBA. Wendy will speak to the company to correct Kevin's pay status. In this next scenario, Riley has been accused by management for damaging equipment in the processing plant and now they want to suspend Riley for it. Riley said he did not damage the equipment and that it was damaged when he started work. Hey, good morning Riley. Long time no see. How long have you been working for this company? 30 years since I started. 30 years. You ever been disciplined before? Not even once. 30 years you haven't been disciplined once? You gotta tell me what's going on. Riley explains to Keith that when he came back to work, the equipment was already damaged, but it didn't affect his ability to do his job. Riley says he reported the equipment damage to the foreman, and the foreman instructed him that he should continue to work. Riley, I need to know who was running that equipment on the shift before you. It's usually Mark. You should check with the supervisor to make sure though. Keith then meets with Mark to further investigate. Mark tells Keith that the equipment was damaged and that he reported it to the foreman. Keith then meets with the foreman and the foreman confirms that both Riley and Mark let her know about the damaged equipment. Keith then gets statements from Riley, Mark and the foreman. Next, Keith meets with the manager that wants to suspend Riley. The manager's only response is that she noticed that the equipment was damaged and that Riley was using it. Keith then provides written statements from Riley, Mark, and the foreman, and also provides the CBA in which states the employer can only discipline employees with just cause. The manager disregards the information and suspends Riley for three days. You ask the manager to put it in writing, in which she does. Based on the scenario, the CBA was violated. The company did not have just cause to discipline Riley. At this point, there is a violation of the collective bargaining agreement and a grievance would need to be filed. So in both of those examples, um, the contract was violated, so a grievance was needed. Um, one was a little bit more extensive than the other one, right? Um, it's, it should be, I mean, note that, it should be fairly simple to uh, fix a wage dispute, right? He was making less money than he technically was supposed to be making um, based off of the contract. Therefore, management should uh, just resolve the issue very quickly. Um, but we, we all know that that's not always the case. But in that situation, it was handled quickly. Um, so hopefully you have a fairly good idea about what a grievance is, like what are your options as far as a grievance, um, you know, as far as the grievance process goes. So if you are interested in becoming a steward, I would reach out to your local, to your union representative, um, and ask about a steward, their steward program. We always have great trainings um, about for stewards. So always be on the lookout for those. So hopefully you can jump in and, you know, get the necessary training you need to be um, an effective steward. Um, like I said, there's a lot, a lot more information out there. So be on the lookout for those trainings. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll have training for that in the near future. And, you know, hopefully we can you know, train more stewards to help out their coworkers and help out themselves, you know, when they're in the workplace because it's one of the great tools we have as union members is the grievance process. And, you know, being a steward allows you to represent, you know, your fellow coworkers. So I want to thank you guys for listening. 
Um, hopefully you learned a lot. Um, hopefully you can share this knowledge with other people. Um, and hopefully you can, you know, seek out more information. So thank you guys for listening. Um, and, you know, as I end the podcast, I just want to share this brief clip about wine garden rights, which go hand in hand uh, when, you know, you start to begin a grievance or when you're dealing with management, it's vital information and it's extremely important. So take a listen and I will see you guys next time. In 1975, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of the National Labor Relations Board versus the Jade Weingarten Incorporated, upheld a decision that said that employees have a right to union representation at an investigatory interview. These rights have become known as the Weingarten rights. The case actually comes from a worker at a lunch counter named Laura Collins. She was accused of stealing a large box of chicken when only paying for a small. Even after explaining to the employer that she took the right amount of chicken and only used a large box because there were no more smaller boxes left, they still would not believe her. her her story did later check out and she was cleared. Several times during the interview, Collins requested her union rep and was denied. Now, despite orders afterwards to keep quiet about the situation, Laura wasn't having it. Collins told her shop steward about the incident, an unfair labor practice was filed, and the results are that today union workers have the right to representation because one courageous woman working at the lunch counter would not be pushed around. So what wine garden rights do is guarantee an employee the right to union representation at an investigatory interview when they have a reasonable belief that discipline may result. But they have to be requested. A supervisor is not required to tell you what your rights are. Once requested, the employer has three options. They can delay the interview until union representation is present. They can end the interview or ask if the employee is willing to proceed without union representation. No. The person representing you under Weingarten has a right to know what the subject is before the meeting. They get to counsel you privately beforehand, help with clarifying questions, they can give you counsel on how to answer questions, and they can also provide additional information to the employer after the interview is over. They don't run the interview, but they are also not required to be silent witnesses. Question, do non-union workers have these rights? Answer, no. Weingarten rights only extend to union workers. So to wrap things up, in June of 1972, Laura Collins decided to buy some chicken that she was going to donate to a church dinner. She had no idea that her demands for union representation would go all the way to the Supreme Court and that her bravery and determination would win some of the most important worker rights in labor history. And the cost of that chicken? One dollar.